Roaring 20s is a, is a great way to describe the leaderboard. Uh, they are roaring. Uh, look at who's leading. You've got Spy and the Qs. This is the tip of the spear for the trading crowd. So these will lead a rally, and they are, and they have been. So you see a lot of money pouring into anything that has risk. You've got uh, uh, International here that's Emerging Markets, VTS, the whole market, EEM. There's a couple of Vanguard in here that could be tax-related, but they're so overwhelmed by the flows going in legit into risk on ETFs. Now let's check out, is this a trading crowd moved or uh, is retail? What's retail investors, mom and pop, what are they doing? Here's our trader versus allocator chart and you can see both are about even and you rarely see this kind of unity between the traders and the allocators. Look how normally they're doing on different pages, the allocators do their thing, but uh, that's a good sign. That tells you everybody is at the party. They're using ETFs like SPY, VTI, IEFA and EFA. Now let's look at equities versus fixed income. Remember, it had been the year of the fixed income ETF uh, for many, many months. In fact, here was a $45 billion gap. But look at the surge, the late surge by equity ETFs. Now it is a dead heat with uh, only 10 days left. And Scarlett, don't be surprised if equity actually turns this into a trouncing and wins by 20, 10 or $20 billion. And you end up winning a bet as well. All right, let's bring that in too. Jamie Gardner, co-founder and COO of TPW Investment Management, and Sarah Ponzak, a cross-asset reporter for Bloomberg News. Jamie, a lot of people in the ETF world call 2019 the year of fixed income. But as Eric showed us, this late surge in inflows into equity funds really has allowed them to catch up with fixed income flows. What's your take on this? Yeah, so uh, not surprising to Eric and not surprising to us that equities are going to take over fixed income. Uh, we were on the show a couple months ago and talking about the fall risk asset rally. And we've kind of moved that to our 2020 outlook, which is reflation 2020. So we were looking at global growth bottoming was the key there, looking at easy monetary policy and fiscal policy, and then earnings expectations next year are going to beat. So with that all in mind, you're starting to see the flows catch up to the fundamentals mm -hmm. and what people are seeing in the markets. And so we really think that these flows are going to continue into the first half of 2020 and uh, maybe all year 2020. So this is not just a late push at the year end. Maybe all year 2020. Sarah, how much does FOMO play into this? Because this time last year, no one really thought that 2019 was going to be a blockbuster year. People were panicking. Right. So we're seeing the mirror image of that now, it seems. And FOMO can certainly be a part of it. If you look at the latest Bank of America Merrill Lynch Fund Manager survey, they saw that over the past two months, the largest jump in growth expectations on record. But the fundamentals, as Jamie alluded to, we're seeing a confirmation of it. We've seen a bottoming in global PMI. We've seen an uninversion of the yield curve. We see continued labor market strength in the United States. And J.P. Morgan has actually been talking about this phenomenon of three-year cycles, the idea that you have a mini crisis every three years and then you get a recovery. In 2011, 2012, Eurozone crisis. In 2015, you have the devaluation of the yuan. We had it again at the end of 2018. And if that's true, if you believe in the phenomenon, then what that means is we can actually be in a bit of a recovery stage right now. That is amazing to think about. Um, and how does that square with your picks? I asked you to bring your five ETFs that you like. One of them on here is value, IUSV. Uh, why value given that optimism and why that uh, specific ETF? Yeah, so uh, one of the charts that Bloomberg put out a few weeks ago too was that the expectations for the S&P next year are 4%, which is the lowest in 15 years. So again, that, that supports our look that people and the market is under expecting what's gonna happen next year. And we're seeing a shift to value cyclicals and size. So IUSV is our value pick. For that, it's a core pick for ours. So it's four basis points, which is incredible that we're able to get value exposure for four basis points. And it's kind of the vanilla version of it. I know there are other value picks you could do, but for our core positioning, we want that. With small cap, we have IJR, also another low cost, seven basis points. It's pretty incredible that we're able to get this exposure. Been in the ETF industry for over a decade. Right. And the products are getting better and better and cheaper and cheaper. It's, it's kind of, we're, we're now able, if uh, Jay Pulaski does, we're the chefs and ETFs are the ingredients my partner, and we're able to do farm-to-table organic now <laughs> for, the, for the price of fast food, which is, which is just incredible. Uh, Love and, the metaphor. Yeah. Love the well metaphor. Played. And I heard low cost a couple of times there. Value clearly was unloved over the past year. International was also pretty unloved, Sarah. Um, but the reasoning here for why the, uh, International may see it's time to shine right now is because you've got an accommodating Fed, you've got a truce in the trade war, and 
reportedly the Brexit cloud has lifted, although it seems to be, have been replaced by another cloud. Right. After the UK election, it seemed like the risk of a no-deal Brexit was off the table. Now maybe it is back on the table. But what this is really representative of is that, yes, we have had such disparity in valuations between international funds and also U.S. funds because we have just seen such immense U.S. outperformance. But risks still do remain, whether that is the advent of potentially a no-deal Brexit. Yes, we do have that phase one trade deal, but now we're looking forward to a phase two trade deal. What does that mean? Can more tariffs actually be put back in place? It does seem like a consensus trade for next year is international over U.S. However, I will say I spoke with one investment manager at BMO mm -hmm. earlier this week, and he did mention that the U.S. is still their favorite part of the U.S., although Europe looks a little bit more attractive. BlackRock said the same thing this past week, too. Still favor U.S., but Europe is starting to look a little bit more attractive. Um, Jamie, you own Europe. You guys tend to lean international. Um, IE US, I believe, is the one you use as a small cap. Why small caps when you're going to play this? Yeah, so we actually favor the rest of the world over the US, so a little bit opposite of what uh, she's been talking to other managers doing. Um, and we think there's a, a huge opportunity there. One, it's got an industrial tilt, which is great for global growth bottoming, the small cap. It also has a third of the exposure in UK. We've avoided the UK for the past two years and really focused more on the Eurozone. Now we're doing all European by IE US. Um, and that really gets its exposure to kind of the growth in, in the bottom of global growth, really helps industrials, helps Europe, helps an underloved uh, area of the market in terms of flows. You're seeing, uh, you don't see anyone looking at Europe, let alone small cap. Another holding we do have is European financials, which is, if you're talking about very underloved, <laughs> that's, that's been a space that, you know, priced the book under one, uh, has been incredibly underloved, got a value play there as well. And very quickly, you also like uh, EMQQ in China in particular. Yeah, EMQQ is actually a very interesting play on the emerging market consumer. Uh, our firm's TPW, Tripolar World, which really talks to the regionalization. Um, and the regionalization of the emerging market consumer, the way to play that is not what they're buying, because they're going to be buying that from U.S. companies, mm. big conglomerates. Mm -hmm. It's what platforms are they using. So you get Alibaba, Tencent, uh, Mercado Libre in there. So you really get uh, companies that have exposure to the emerging market consumer. Got it. Uh, that's more of a niche play for us, not one of our big core holdings, but uh, an interesting, uh, interesting play.